and welcome everyone. Um, I want to make sure that everybody says we're going to have a really honest dialogue about real issues. And if you notice, there's an empty chair there at the end, and that is the elephant in the room, right? Um, and we talk about what is the elephant in the room. I'm going to use the definition to start us off. Uh, Wikipedia, which is, you know, disrupted the end of Encyclopedia Britannica and all those other things, defines the elephant in the room as an English metaphorical idiom for an obvious truth that is either being ignored or going unaddressed. The idiomatic expression also applies to an obvious problem or risk no one wants to discuss. But that's what we're going to discuss today. So I'm going to start off with uh, my colleague, Dr. Fred, um, and, and ask other people to chime in on the same questions. Who were the thought leaders in supplier diversity 20 years ago, and who are the thought leaders today? Well, I actually can't tell you who the thought leaders were 20 years ago, because 20 years ago I was doing something else. Um, but I think the thought leaders today are on this, on this panel, uh, in the NMSDC, uh, in the supplier diversity space, uh, within our corporations, uh, with, at the national level, and our colleagues in the NMSDC, and also in WeBank, and, and, and some writers. I mean, I think that there are some, some writers, some uh, academics out there that are paying attention to this. Uh, and I think in, in that pool, you'll find the leadership. So Dr. Fred, and I'm going to ask others to chime in a second. A lot of people will say, you know, we, a lot of us 20, 25 years ago started with the Ralph Moore playbook, right? right? That was kind of the playbook on supplier diversity. Mm -hmm. But some people are using that exact same playbook. And, and it was great for 25 years ago, but the world has changed a lot in, in 20, 25 years. And, you know, a lot of people are still running that playbook. But like you or I, me walking around with an A-track tape up here, right? right? You know, what are others on the panel say? How, where is the new leadership, and is there new leadership, and, and what's the impact on us having this kind of conversation, right? Because leadership is what drives change. Well, I'll, I'll uh, jump in and, and say that while I wasn't around 20 years ago as well, uh, as I understand it, a lot of what drove the uh, development and undergirded the, the, the case for uh, minority supplier development uh, stemmed from those industries where there was a focus on um, building and growing a consumer base that would purchase their products, among them the automotive industry. And of course, you know, Lewis, you live with the automotives on a daily basis. You know, people like Ray Jensen and others you know, were very instrumental in establishing certain, uh, uh, certain types of frameworks for the work that we do around uh, how to uh, create a, a corporate program, how to measure it, which uh, I understand uh, Ralph Moore and, and RGMA and Associates further refined uh, into uh, a package that will allow a company to you know, find itself at one of the five levels of supplier diversity. Uh, and you know, without any other benchmarks, I think that's become sort of the playbook that people continue to use. And, and like any playbook, uh, you don't have any new uh, ideas or new innovations until you're forced to innovate. I'd like to add to that, yeah, being in the hospitality space, I think Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, uh, very much like the automotive industry, were focused on how do we sell to these different multicultural groups. And that's really what drove it. Uh, additionally, I think those people that were in community relations and corporate relations, who were sometimes put there to keep the natives quiet, um, uh, also recognized there were business opportunities there. And so I think those were probably where some of these seeds have developed. If you fast forward to where we are today, in the food service and hospitality industry, I think we've lost ground. I think that, there, that because of some of the things that uh, we see with the economy, uh, technology, because maybe on the MBE side and on the supply diversity side, we haven't moved technology as fast as we should. Um, but because there's no pressure being put on some of these companies, they don't think they need to do it. And we don't have people doing boycotts like we celebrate this weekend, you know, 50 years ago, People were willing to put their lives at risk. And now I think we've got a lot of safe folks in corporate America. You know, we're really safe. I don't want to mess up my corporate uh, circumstances. I don't want to, I want to save a few more dollars to get my house on the waterfront. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm not that anxious to put it all out there. 
So th this is a good point. So, so Sally and, and Jessica, I'm gonna come to you on that. And I served in that, and you know, so I understand that risk because on the one hand, you're there to advocate for suppliers, mm -hmm. but again, your corporation has, there's only so much a corporation wants to do. And at some point, where, where's the line between being an effective advocate and where people, you know, are there, were there times where you wanted to advocate or you are not you, you see someone wants to advocate, but they're, they're fearful of maintaining their employment. It's hard to be an advocate when someone signs your paycheck, right? Because their interest first. So Sally and Jessica, if you guys could talk about that dynamic. Well, um, first of all, I want to thank you all for having us here on the panel. It's an honor to be here and talk about the topic. Um, and I want to start with your question around where is the thought leadership? I really believe that thought leadership for supplier diversity started with Martin Luther King because he wasn't just talking about the economic, the um, demographic shifts, but also the movement of econo shifting of economic power to those groups. And I think while America made a lot of stride on the let's all eat in the same place and go to the same schools and be able to vote, um, we haven't made as much progress on shifting. I'll Shift. speak louder. Yeah. <laughs> um, on shifting the economic power. And yes, 20 or 30 years later, the NMSDC, their leadership, Ralph Moore, Reggie Williams, all those who put together the stages of excellence in supplier diversity did a lot of great work. I think it kind of got a little stuck there. Um, when I joined supplier diversity um, three and a half years ago, um, I had no idea what supplier diversity was. I didn't know what MBE, WBE, it was acronyms being um, thrown around. I'm a doctor, small business owner, have an MBA, been in business. So my boss said, can you look at this program? It's called National Supplier Diversity and we're having trouble with it. And I said, why would an organization waste any time or money on when you need to buy a widget? Why, you know, why, if you wanna buy a widget, go buy it from Johnson & Johnson. Why are you wasting your time on a program like this? And um, he said, well, why don't you just look into it? And when I did, the, the business case of when you look at, if you really are going to be an American citizen living in this country and your children will be here, and at the time I was still, I moved here from Egypt 10 years ago and I didn't have my citizenship yet. But if you really look at where the economy of this country is going and that shift, you believe in the cause. So I signed up after I educated myself on the cause. But here's what I found. Once I got passionate around it and I put together this program of um, asking Kaiser Permanente to double its spend to reach the billion dollars of spend on a, on a commitment level, when I'd say billion dollar round table, nobody knew who they were. When I'd say NMSDC, few people knew who they were. So what I realized is there's a real disconnect in the level of the C-suite levels of an organization knowing enough about these programs. Now when I was able to articulate to them the why, it became crystal clear. Um, our CEO asked me, why should I do this? After I explained the whole we need to do goals and this is and that and blah, blah. Um, I said, where is your market share coming from in the future? We're in healthcare. The majority of the uninsured in this country are minorities. So our growth is in that sector. Do you want them to be able to afford us? Do you want them to have the income and the jobs that allow them to afford our service? And we were sold. And we've committed three years ago to doubling our spend from half a billion to one billion, and this year we're getting there. But um, I think there, there are thought leaders today in the country. They're just speaking to the same group. The, the, the message hasn't gone out of these rooms. And I think if supplier diversity leaders, thought leaders today, like I was just at the BDR summit with you, um, great thought leadership, great messages. But how do we get in front of a platform of the Fortune 1000 company CEOs and say that message there? Yeah, good point, Seth. Jessica, I'm, gonna come, I'm not gonna forget about you. I just <laughs> wanna follow up on the corporate end and we're gonna get right. I'm glad, see, Victoria is anxious, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a challenge in a corporation when there's not leadership from the CEO. So the question is, how do you get your CEO engaged? Uh, and keep uh, your job. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, luckily, <laughs> for my background is more in procurement and contract management, sourcing, um, and then I got very strongly um, involved in sustainability and, and ruled out a lot of sustainability programs within our corporation. And I think, you know, it's a little bit different place in, in Caesars Entertainment. We've been committed to the community. I have a great team that on, you know, all levels that are around me that work every day in this commitment to the community. And I think that's a great uh, establishment or place to kind of jump off from. But how do you get your CEO engaged? So a little over two years, or not quite two years ago, um, we knew that we needed to get upper management more engaged in the process. So thinking and talking to other thought leaders, we had our own supplier diversity summit and had our CFO attend, everyone from finance because we wanted to make dollars and cents. When you think of supplier diversity, there's kind of three levels of this continuum. There's the have to do, we need our gaming license compliance. There's the nice to do, this is great inclusion with the community. And there's the business case of doing it. This is making us money or saving us money and it's truly sustainable within our business. And so after hearing some of the, you know, the great, uh, other great speakers, Reggie Layton being one of them, on the ROI of supplier diversity, we invited him and, and, uh, and P&G and Disney and others to come and talk to us on this really intimate place where we had our CFO there and listened to the ROI. Well, I can tell you my chief procurement officer was sold that day. He had been interested before, but hearing it from other mouths other than my own mouth to say, this makes business case and these are the businesses we've included and this is how we've saved money and this is how we've made money, they were engaged. And so for the last couple of years, we've been meeting with our CEO who will not let me not meet with him every year along with my team to talk about who are our amazing businesses. And what we found is, you know, we have a, a marketing program right now talked about millionaire makers. And so millionaire makers, are we, we've given out over 700 people, a million, million dollars, so are jackpot winners. But I think the untold story is our millionaire makers that have made their own millions by being a part of our corporation and really growing. And furthermore, not just within our own corporation, but we've introduced them in a lot of the way we engage with communities. We've done a lot of new build recently with other businesses within the local community that they've done business with, even before getting to us, that grew them to a level at which they can make a million dollars and then continue to do business with companies like us. So I think having the CEO engaged, having the CFO engaged, and finding innovative ways to engage, we now have an advocate committee of our general man, of you know, eight to 10 general managers that meet every quarter and talk about how can we move this forward. And I can tell you that all of their employees now, because their bosses are interested in it, this, it's exciting for them. They want to make it happen, and so that really drives a lot of the process. So just to follow up, so with CFOs and CEOs, they love data, they love metrics, and, and so what kind of metrics are they tracking, number one? And then what's the real impact, though? I mean, you know, because you know, you know, we talked about coming from the billion dollar. I think a billion dollars is great. But what does it mean, right? If, if you're spending, and I say that to my folks in automotive who do some amazing things, but what's the difference if I told you this year I did three billion, the next year I did four billion? What impact, what difference? So what metrics are you using in the company, number one? And number two, how do you actually, are you at this point measuring the impact of what you're doing in your program? I think, so for us, when we look at our metrics, our metrics, we have different metrics. Some of them are internal, some of them are external. But one that's key is we measure our individuals and our sourcing team based on their inclusion in RFP, so economic inclusion. They have to have a diverse vendor included in the RFP. Who did they include? How much did they really go through? Because the results will slowly get there, but it's a lot more around the process that's there. And I think Ralph Moore is kind of the leader in this idea, but uh, the, around the process. Who are you including? How often are you including? And, and, and what's been the result of that? And I think the impact on the community, it's even a different concept. You know, we recently built in, um, in Cleveland and Cincinnati, and we, the people we partner with, Dan Gilbert, is, is really involved in, in diversity and inclusion, and he's um, been a great leader for us. But I, when I think of businesses looking at this, you know, we looked at our construction spend in Cleveland, for example, at 43% of our construction spend. I mean, it's, it's those numbers that are, are, are telling, but the more telling part is we have our, our partners come and talk about it and they say, 
you know, it's not just my restaurant. All the restaurants in Cleveland now are so busy and they're getting more business than they ever thought. And I think hearing that from community leaders is really, is really what's telling because we can measure data, but you can't just measure the data on this. So, so Victoria, I'm hoping I'm saving the best for last for opening. You know, I see you wanted to jump in earlier. So there's something you wanted to address, but I do have a question for you, but I'll let you go ahead and jump in with what, what oh, you had. Sure, I, I mean, I, I think uh, your opening question about sort of the past and the future of supplier diversity was a, a great question. And I also want to also thank uh, the LA MSDC for inviting us to this conversation. I think it's significant to have and GLCC of the LGBT community represented on this panel. So first, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm honored and very proud to be here. Um, and also thank you to the presenting sponsor, Chevron, who's a great partner of NGLCCs nationally. Um, but I think, you know, NGLCC is in a position where the organization itself is 10 years old. Our certification is a little over five years old. So when we talk about the past and the future, we are pretty firmly rooted in the future. But it's important for us to understand the past and to understand the origins of supplier diversity and that growth and, and what it has meant for businesses along the way, what it's meant for corporate America and that journey of figuring out how do we do this and how do we do it well. Um, and so I'm honored to be on the panel with folks that are doing it well and that have, have uh, contributed to that success. And I think for us, it's, um, you know, it's looking at it as a, a market-driven concept. Um, for the LGBT community, um, NGLCC, we talk about supplier diversity as completing the circle of corporate diversity. So when we speak with companies, we're talking about how your, your employee base includes LGBT people. Your customer base includes LGBT people. Does your supply chain. It just makes common sense to really be looking at that. And also understanding the communities that you impact, where you do your work, how you do your work. LGBT people are in our community in all places. And, and building on that, the LGBT community also includes all other communities. I think we're in a very unique position in that folks that are LGBT often are not just wearing one layer of identity. I mean, the, the LGBT community includes African American people and women and Hispanic and Asian, everyone, right? And so the future of supplier diversity I see from, from our position in GLCC is truly rooted in collaboration. I don't think that you know, to move this entire concept of supplier diversity forward, it's not about organizations working in siloed ways with just their, the same old constituents and the, the same businesses and saying, okay, we're just gonna build them bigger in their silos. It's about working together and figuring out, okay, how do we think strategically about what these businesses need to really get to that next level? Because oftentimes it's not just one thing found in our own communities. So um, I think this conversation is a great place to start that. Uh, NGLCC specifically, over the last two years, has started a group called the National Business Inclusion Consortium. And it's a round table with the certifying organizations, with uh, the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. PAC, the National Black Justice Coalition. Um, we're excited and thrilled to invite NMSTC to participate on that. Uh, the U.S. Business Leadership Network, so they certify businesses that are owned by people with disabilities, to really talk about, okay, it's great that we're doing this work in our own individual communities, but to really elevate it and to allow corporations to understand that it's not just a percentage over here. It's actually your entire supply base. It's everything you're doing. Diversity is throughout your workforce, throughout your community, everywhere. I think we really need to start thinking creatively about how we work together. So let's, let's follow up on working together because I think for most people and most corporations, honestly, it's a zero sum game, right? <laughs> You know, our, the, the former leader of NMSTC used to famously say, pretty soon diversity is going to be everybody who, you know, but straight white men, right? Because, you know, kind of would start off with, with minority groups and then with women and veterans and LGBT and veterans and it goes and goes and pretty soon, but the pie isn't getting any bigger, right? The corporations aren't, it's not additive typically. Um, you know, if they said, okay, we're going to, when a lot of companies decided to say, okay, we're gonna to start to include women as supplier diversity, so let's increase the amount we spend by four or five percent. It wasn't additive. And when we add veterans, let's increase it another five percent. And when we add LGBT, let's increase it. So, you know, it's it's that same little slice. And so you talked about working cooperatively, which which is interesting because so many people, and I think a lot of suppliers and, and people seem like they're fighting for resources and it, it hasn't been as cooperative and strategic, I, I think. So how do, you, how do you answer that when people say, guys, you know, we're, we're fighting over crumbs on the table and now you're coming to slice another crumb off of that, off of that, off of that piece. How do you address that? Um, 
I, I, want, to, I want to Victoria first because sure, sure. you, I mean, you guys are kind no, of the, the best, latest yeah. into the, into no, the space. No, absolutely. And that's always the question. And, um, and I, I do a lot of our, our building our corporate relationships and, and having those conversations about saying, well, you know, we, we like this idea, but you know, the, it is what it is. There's only this much. But I think the dialogue is shifting around that. I, I really, truly do. And the conversations, at least, that we're having, it's not just saying, okay, there's a finite amount of diverse spend. It's understanding, let's figure out how that diverse spend percent, how that grows. Because is it, you know, when you're looking at, okay, if we're just going to specifics around dollars and cents and contracting, it's looking for different opportunities to build it into the, um, really the culture of the organization. It's not just one supplier diversity person going around and sort of, you know, trying to get buyers to use diverse suppliers. It's really integrating it into the entire purchasing process, the entire procurement process, and seeing, you know, a lot of times, what are you already doing? And, and it's talking about, you know, where can we look at diverse suppliers from there? Um, and I also think in terms of supplier development, that's a great area um, for collaboration, a great area for, for helping businesses grow to the point where they can be those, those prime suppliers, where they can be the ones that hold the big contracts, because that's something that there's great opportunity there. Um, and I don't know that there are a lot of companies that have done a fantastic job of working towards that, but I think there's so much more opportunity. To yeah, well, the majority, that. frankly, the majority of companies don't do crap in terms of increasing. I mean, it's the rare few that really do something. I mean, let's be honest about it. The, the understated thing is there's a piece for diverse folks that might be five, might be seven, might be 10, but for you know, the, you know, everybody else, a straight white man, it's 90, pick whatever point thing. I mean, that's been the social contract. Dr. Fred or Marcus, yeah, or anybody want to uh, talk about yeah, that? Yeah, I wanted to chime in on not just the private sector, but this is an issue in public sector procurement as well. Uh, in our region, Connecticut uh, is uh, what is probably, the state of Connecticut is the largest procurer of services and goods in the state. And they've had a uh, supplier diversity program that goes back 25 years. Uh, based on a 30-year-old um, disparity study that came out with the conclusion that the goal should be 6.25% of all state contracts should go to diverse suppliers. And what's happened, to your point, is that the types, the categories of diverse suppliers has increased. And so what you've seen is a program that at one time had about 60% of that spend going to ethnic minorities is now down below 5% of the spend going to ethnic minorities. Now, this can become a very contentious issue between the diverse groups that are included in this program. But that is a structural problem. That's a legal problem where the, the law has not kept up with the reality and the other issue is these disparity studies aren't cheap, either for private sector or the public sector, uh, uh, who don't want to get sued, particularly in the public sector, on the, great, on the basis of some sort of reverse discrimination action. But you're right that you know, there is, in my view, a, a, a supplier diversity goal for white male-owned businesses well over 90%, right. and they want, they want all the business. <laughs> they don't want to share any of it. But the, the challenges that, that, that I see is that we've got to work on the, the legal aspect that, uh, that needs to change the law, uh, where uh, it doesn't work to keep adding, to Harriet's point, it doesn't work to keep adding groups without increasing the numbers. And you know, I think the numbers, uh, they are actually a joke. Any, anything below single, the double digits is, is really a joke when you're talking about goals, in my view, at the, at the public sector level or the private level, uh, the private sector. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, um, you know, while no one would ever argue that more diversity isn't a good and proper thing given, you know, the increasing globalization uh, of our businesses, our communities, et cetera, uh, and Lewis, you spoke to this a moment ago, the, the whole concept of economic impact tends to get lost when you start talking about increasing diversity from a supplier standpoint. You know, we've been real clear, not just because of our um, uh, initiation of and implementation of a five-year strategic plan, but uh, you know, we've been telling folks that we're not in the minority business development business any longer. We're in the minority supplier development business and probably have been for uh, more than a decade. Why? Because 
40 years ago or even uh, more recently 25 years ago, there weren't enough minority suppliers of scale and capacity to service the corporations who as members identified their needs from a business case that wasn't as fully baked as it might be today. So, you know, for us to think that uh, we'll be able to um, look at more categories of diversity really belies the very reason we were created in the first place. So we believe we're at a point where, um, to Dr. Fred's point, you know, public policy you know, in, informs, if not uh, um, initiates uh, public behavior. Our public, if you will, is our corporate members. And while some of our corporate members are bound by compliance requirements because they um, do business with public entities and public agencies, the remainder of them have to have us uh, support the, the, the construction of a case that transcends more diversity, but really focuses on the impact of the communities where they believe they'll get their, their future customers and where their customers' customers are going to come from. So a lot of what we're going to be doing is um, trying to look at um, not just how to measure spend, but really how to measure economic impact. In fact, I'm really pleased that um, the Louisiana Council um, introduced today a uh, economic impact study similar to the one that um, some of you may know uh, was done, um, what was it, Dr. Saba, uh, a year or two ago in Northern California that really illustrates this is the impact of developing minority suppliers. Mm -hmm. Not to the um, uh, exclusion of other diverse suppliers, but to the inclusion of um, the difference that it makes in Asian, Black, Hispanic, and Native American communities when you use a supplier that hires employees, that purchases goods and services, that really contributes to the economic tax base of a community, that's the work that we see uh, us needing to focus on um, while at the same time you know, really uh, it, it, it being a part of the, the, the broader or, or more importantly the, the global concept of supply diversity. And if I may, may add one other thing, what we really are, are, are committing to is um, a new reality in that um, while there is a perspective that the pie is getting um, sliced further and further or, or, or into small, smaller slices, you know, on some level we've got to think about how do we bake a new pie? How do we now encourage more small suppliers to strategically align with other suppliers to take advantage of the opportunities that are being presented to them by corporations that want to increase their spend but have difficulty because they don't have the kinds of suppliers that have capacity to go where they need to go because there are very few corporations except those that are purely local that are not doing business across the entire country. In fact, um, I haven't looked at the recent statistics, but uh, I would suggest that a significant number of multinational companies are doing a, a higher percentage of the business outside the U.S. than in the U.S. So we have to think about that, and, and, and as one uh, um, result, we have a uh, Global Link program that has analogies to NMSDC in five countries. But we can't just stop there. We've got to look at you know what makes up that pie. How is that pie actually benefiting those um, businesses that pay us a membership to have access to resources, to ha have access to data, some of it data that we've never been able to utilize before? That's really where we see ourselves. So, so Marcus, let me, and I, I agree with what you said, but I, I, the thing that still troubles me, and uh, when I was at, at General Electric, and you know, we doubled or tripled our supplier versus spend, and, uh, person in C-suite said, Lewis, it's great you're doing that, but you know what? If you come in this meeting and tell me each year you're spending more money, that's not what gets attention in the boardroom. We never like to hear you're spending more year after year. So if you tell me you're going from $1 billion to $4 billion to $10 billion, that's not going to get you anywhere in here. That's not what we want. We want metrics that show that it moves our business. And again, as a, a group, we always talk about what are you spending with suppliers? Mm -hmm. But there, where are the business metrics? If this is if Supplier diversity is going to mean anything to get past a little slice of pie. Where are any of us, where are actual business metrics that if there's P&L wise or says somebody who cares about things in the company, because any company, you know, they may have a great heart and they hire smart people like Sally and all you folks here, but business is about making money in, in this society and, and our, the metrics around this space 
don't do that, and so therefore the isolation. Where is what's going to change that? Sally, you want to? Or... Yes, um, I do want to underscore something that Marcus said, and a little bit of what Victoria said as well, because it is important to collaborate, definitely. But that depends on the organization's culture, whether. At the crux of the matter really is leadership. Has the leader set the right tone for what that organization stands for? So I, I'm very privileged only because in my organization, Bernard Tyson, African American CEO, he wasn't asking me why should I do this because he didn't know. He was asking to see do I really, really get it, right? Um, but there aren't that many CEOs like that that are thinking like that. Less than 20% of all Fortune 1000 companies in America even have diversity programs at all, whether workforce or, or anything else. So leadership at the, at the top, but then that's what sets the tone. What does the organization stand for? Now organizations that stand for only the bottom line of money today, can you show to me the ROI today on my P&L? they're not supporting this as much. Organizations that stand for betterment of communities, that have a mission in life, like I want to make lives better, that's Kaiser Permanente's mission, or I want to, in case of Disney or Caesar, I want to make people happy. So they are on a, on a cause, on a mission, and they've created a culture throughout their organization that supports that. Now the trickle effect, when Kaiser Permanente said we are going to reach the billion and we were serious about it, and we started with metrics, although I'll, I'll answer the other part of what are the other attributes we should measure. In our construction space, we were doing 42% or something like that, but the problem that we faced is there weren't enough suppliers out there that could hold our business. We actually allocated in our facilities space, we said that every year, worth $50 million, we will diverse only bid. So your white folks won't even get to bid on it. So the problem we faced is there weren't enough people to bid. When we're a union shop, when we have regulations, when we have this and that, so the supply base wasn't ready. So what we are seeing is a shift in the market. The bigger folks want to partner with them even without us asking them. They're saying, well, we'll partner with you and we'll come with you and support you and back you with finances and so forth. So it really comes from we need more organizations that are committed to it and then have that trickle down effect in the community and the market and so forth. Now, how do you, how do you measure the other things? So we're trying to look at, okay, so how many jobs did you add? So how many, how do you do a, um, an economic impact like Scott Bowles did and, and others are doing right now? And those are harder metrics because they're very long term. Mm -hmm. They're not almost in our lifetime. I keep telling people when I go around, supplier diversity professionals are in a business to put themselves out of business. If, if our children are in these places when we've grown up and we're not here anymore, then we haven't done a good enough job because supplier diversity shouldn't be the fringe and an adjunct, it should be mainstream what we're doing. If people are going to procurement schools and getting um, certificates on how to procure, it should be part of that. How do you build economic growth in your country? How do you create competitiveness and innovation? Not, let's say, have a, here's a supplier diversity but certificate You're telling me side. we should be healthy, yeah. eat right, and exercise. I think everybody <laughs> knows that, but there's suppliers out here who aren't getting opportunities. Right, because most corporations, and you know, that's, that's the bad thing. I can't pick on you guys here because you guys are very good at what you do. Mm -hmm. But you know, you guys are like, you know, the one percent of corporations, right? There are so many MBEs who don't get opportunities because people aren't serious about it, mm -hmm. because there are no metrics and there are no CEOs that talk to other CEOs that say you need to do this and it's a competitive advantage. And there seems to be a void of leadership around all that, and, and I think MBEs are paying the price, and they can't, they're trying to get a contract, so they're not gonna wave the flag in your face and say, you guys are doing a crappy job at all, not anybody here personally, but, but that you have this broken dynamic, and at best they're getting low margin business that's not part of growth strategies of companies. And I think that's the frustration and underlying and underperformance that, that we've seen, and that's where you have so many talented MBEs who, who, who just can't get Engage. I see you jumping, Jerry. Go ahead. I, I can't help it. I just can't help it. Um, I'm not a supply diversity official, and I don't claim that to be my expertise. So I want to suggest we look at another element of this. Is look at the market side of it. You know, I'm in the restaurant space. Black and brown and Asian are 
generating revenue for these businesses by working in the restaurant kitchens and the hotel kitchens and the front and the back of the house. And they're also spending money. So when you start looking at why should we be doing supply diversity, because African Americans may be 12% of the population, but for one of our restaurant brands, they're 33%. But you know what, revenue. Jerry, they're still getting that 33% without I, giving them a contract. I, I so why would they well, change? So, so someone's got to start holding them accountable. And speaking from an industry where we have six black CEOs, soon to be seven, um, I would suggest that those leaders and I know I could get a little heat for this, are not in the forefront of promoting supply diversity to the degree that they could be, or maybe that they should be. I don't want to speculate why that is, but I could just say that's the fact. And so I think when you stop making the case, it's not just that there's 100% there's of the supply chain that's, av that's available to be spent uh, with whomever, and only 6% or whatever percent going to MBEs. Well, where are we selling product, or where are we going to be selling product, as Kaiser Permanente said, and how much of the percentage of that group is coming from these groups, and so do we reflect them as employees, and do we reflect them as suppliers? And then I'll say the supply, uh, suppliers themselves, you need to get beyond I'm just jumping. the product. How are you going to help us solve our other business issues? I said, how are you going to help me find that supply chain? If you're an Asian supplier, how are you going to drive me some Asian talent that can come to work for me? If you're black, how are you going to help me find some black franchisees? In the restaurant industry, we are seeing black franchisees evaporate because they're not good operators. And that's the other thing. We talked about quality. We've got to push them non-quality operators to the side. Right. And the same with the supply diversity officers who aren't serious. We have good ones here. Yeah. But we got some fakers out there, you know. Yeah. All they're doing is moving the, 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 the chairs Keep, around the Keeping the seat the warm, keeping their head down. <laughs> you got to call it out. And you know, point to the ones who are doing it right and then say, look, we need to get rid of these, these knuckleheads and make something Dr. happen. Fred yeah. yes. okay, Dr. Fred and Mark. Well, so. I wanted to share. Last, yesterday I was at a uh, supplier um, uh, conference at Bryan University. It was a supply chain management conference. And the keynote speaker was a, uh, a leader at the Gartner Group. They have 35 analysts that just study and, and work on supply chain management and the latest in global supply chain management. And she presented the results of her study, that company's study, on the best supply chain companies in the country. But in addition to that, she had put together a hierarchy of what's important in supply chain management, a pyramid. And it was probably 20 factors in this pyramid. Supplier diversity was not one of those factors. So we have a disconnect yeah. between, these are the leaders right. of global companies that are doing this, and they're not hearing that supplier diversity is part of the hierarchy of what they do. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, that's a real problem. And so I think if you're seeing that at the leadership level, and these are the C-level people, who this is how they are judged. How efficient, how good is our supply chain? And if supplier diversity isn't in that hierarchy, then we need to do a better job as advocates for supplier diversity to get it in there and to explain why it should be there and, and what it means to them to have a, a more effective, more efficient supply chain. I was just about, <laughs> without the, um, uh, the uh, um, erudite way Dr. Fred posed that, to say we own part of that. I mean, NMSDC, we've been incredibly honest about it, particularly the last couple of years, that we own part of that responsibility because, you know, we've been focused on you know building this you know database of of suppliers without regard for whether they were ready now to support the needs of our corporate members, who in many cases, to to your point, Dr. Fred have other factors they consider when they are building and strengthening their supply chain. So we're not ashamed to say that we need to do a much better job, but we're really committing to um, in increasing our partnership with our regional councils because they're really the, where the, the rubber meets the road, it's, they're the boots on the ground, and, and if they aren't um, more capable of helping to, to, for lack of a better term, sell the importance of and the impact of uh, using diverse suppliers, then those factors are not likely to change. Um, and we even see it as a responsibility we have to speak more directly to the C-suite because we believe that the most successful programs are also the most strategic in their view of how is this going to benefit my organization and the outcomes uh, of my day-to-day -day operations. Um, without having the CEOs 
directly engaged in this from a strategic standpoint, um, the programs are always going to be what they are today. Yeah, and, and I mean, I find it interesting. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal that had a really bright intern, and, and young people are a blessing. It showed me an article that supply chains that are strong in supplier diversity perform 133% more efficiently. Now, the supply chain said, well, how was this in the Wall Street Journal three years ago, and I didn't know about it, right? And who's doing that research? Because that's something that the supplier diversity community should have been doing but didn't do. And so I agree. I mean, I think we have failed collectively we, some of our MBEs in terms of making opportunities. And we, and we really have to do a better job in a way to engage those C-suite folks. Uh, and so I'm gonna come back to you because you heard a couple of C-suite folks the other day talking about mm -hmm. it. And yeah, they ran off a bunch of statistics. And so, <laughs> but I'm sure their, and their supplier diversity people are the best and they prepped them. So I'm mm -hmm. sure, but, but and you're in a unique situation, but where does that CEO engagement coming from? Because with that, that pyramid of 20, you know, everybody has, you know, task force on how do we get more minority, you know, talent. I, there's every consumer product company out here knows that how they have to get to the Hispanic market. They're huge, they're growing. Hispanic suppliers are almost non-existent, relatively speaking, underrepresented, dramatically underrepresented in this network. That disconnect, how do, who's gonna handle that disconnect? Where's it gonna come from? So I always say that um, the evangelist is a, huge part of a supplier diversity professional's role. And if they can take one chance at getting to their CEO or the decision maker in their company and get that message across clearly and create an advocate, it will have an effect. Bernard Tyson, after we launched the program, went to a, um, a CEO level only uh, consortium in the healthcare industry. And when he talked to them about our program, four companies started supplier diversity programs from that one talk. Now he's going around in his groups of CEO companies and giving that um, same, same speech. But it's not enough to have one. It's not enough to have 18 only members at the BDR saying it. It's not enough to have the person that came up and spoke was prepped the day before and reading off the statistics. Um, I don't need to brief Bernard before he speaks. I just need to give him the latest data. But when you have those champions at that level who can effect change, it becomes very powerful. But I want to talk about, you said the MBEs are still out there and what they want to, there is a problem with the MBEs being at the right level for the types of corporations they're targeting. When I get an MBE and the first thing out of their mouth is I'm an MBE, I'm like, yeah, so what? Right. Honestly, yeah. because that's not your selling point. Or when I say, here's a template of five slides, tell me what your elevator pitch is. And I've even created the template for them. And they send me a 30 page document telling me about everything and their mother-in-law and their granddaughter. It's like, really? So there is a level of, there's a level of education, a level of prepping that maybe the councils can help us with in terms of how do you prepare these suppliers to really deal with these large, large corporations? If I get a supplier and they say, oh, I need COD, really? Well, we're not gonna pay you COD, so, you know, so there's a lot of education, um, I think, that, um, that needs to be had because at the end of the day, our programs are not affirmative action programs. They are process programs. They are, we are going to make sure that for every sourcing opportunity, if you are out there and listed somewhere, whether embassies, we bank somewhere, we will look for you. And if you're there, we will invite you to bid and we will let go of you. And you have to win on your own merit. That's all we do. So that's perfect. So then, then that actually gets to another question for, for everybody on the panel. Then maybe it's best if you use one supplier that you can do $100 million with versus 10 that you can do $10 million with. I mean, what is that the solution? Is it, is it now that only the, the, the large folks get the contracts? I mean, I, I think I see that in a lot of industries that people want global players. Very few people can do that. And, and the other finger I point at the MBEs, I, see, I know some very large MBEs that do a piss poor job of using other MBEs, right? There's one that came into one of my companies. And, and to one of my folks, they came into Chrysler and said, you know, you're not, you need to do more with me. You know, you haven't hit your goal, you're at 8%. 
And they said, yeah, we're, our goal was 8.4 at 8. And they said, what do you do? Well, well I do 2%, right? They only use 2% for other MBEs, but they're, they're upset about that. So you get these large MBEs. Do you hold them accountable for using other MBEs? Or maybe is it only going to be a large MBE player game from this point forward? Do the little folks need to walk out the door because there's not any room for them? Well, there's multiple strategies. Right. So my strategy with Kaiser Permanente was first a numbers <laughs> game. Why? I set the goal of the, you know, with, with our CEO, the billion dollar round table. Wasn't necessarily for the billion dollar round table. It was a big, hairy, audacious goal to set goals and get it out there and get the company rallied around something. What that did is it allowed for opening the doors for the conversation, for people to get educated around it and so forth. Um, now is the time to start looking at, well, what does our supply base look like and where is the money really flowing? Yes, we do business with around 1,700 MWBEs, okay? But where's all the money? It's with the top 100 because they are the stronger players. They're the WWTs and the SHIs and the right. Roses. And, we all know them, yeah. right? But we took it a step further. Now in RFPs, when we issue them, we will mandate in a request for proposal that you come to the table with a diverse solution if you're not already diverse. In one of our major sectors, our security sector, which, where we spend around half a billion dollars, that was a mandate in the sourcing project. So companies were mandated to work with a, with, with a, with a different business. What we ended up with is a facilities management company that's very, very small, that teamed up with a very, very large company against another diverse supplier in security a diverse supplier yeah. in security, and they competed. And this facilities management company is now taking over our security services in Colorado. So we've expanded even their business portfolio. But it came from, we are, we are the people spending the money. So we should be able to tell people how we kind of want you to do it. Are we doing a good enough job of hoard, holding our crimes accountable? No. Are we setting goals and giving penalties if they don't meet them? No. So we're doing good work, but are we there yet? No, we're not. We're not like China. If you want to do business here, thou shall do X, right. Y, Z. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't, I'm going to penalize you. Yeah. We're still kind of wishy-washy on that and putting our foot down because it's a longer process. And it really takes time to get over the why supplier diversity matters and then get into the, OK, now let's, how, how do we do it better? I think the councils you know, have um, a responsibility to help you all tell your success stories in ways that are, first of all, congratulate, the Billion Dollar Roundtable, that's amazing and very, very important. Um, to sort of touch on something you said a little bit before, you know, supplier diversity is in this, this interesting in-between point of you want to you want to celebrate that you've spent more money, but internally, you also need to address the fact that supplier diversity, you know, it's a success when there's cost savings. It's mm -hmm. a success whenever, you know, you're saving the company money. So how do you tell that story externally that, you know, continues to push your program forward. And I think that um, as, a, as a council that works with many of the companies that have great stories around that to tell, the onus is a little bit on us to help those stories be told in a way that resonates with our communities. And it isn't seen as being, oh, you're spending less. Well, no, you're, you're sure. opening an opportunity for more spend with other diverse small businesses or not small businesses, diverse large businesses. Um, and that cost saving story can be something that is celebrated in a way. And I think um, for us to sort of the councils to ruminate on how we successfully tell that story in a way that champions you all and also it gives you more of an ability to go internally and say, look at the success and we're being recognized for that success. Mm -hmm. That's something effective that we can do. A, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. There, there needs to be more. Um, we've signed many contracts with MWBEs. We never get a letter from anybody to a CEO saying, thank you, right. your supplier diversity program actually worked and I got a contract. We just hear from the, I've been knocking on your door for two years and I didn't get anything right. yet. So we're not, it, it's harder. And supplier diversity professionals, they, they need, they, they need the, the industry to give them backbone. They, they need the advocacy to really continue for people to start choosing to buy from companies that support these causes and not buy from companies that don't. I mean, yesterday it was very provocative. Ralph Moore stood up and said, I use Bing because Google doesn't support supplier diversity. And then an MBE stood up and said, well, Google actually supports me and gave me money to, to do some tool and stuff like right. that. 
But see where the conversation is going. It's about where are you going to spend your dollars? Who are who is advocating for you? But we need yeah. your guys' help in telling that story because we're inundated with the daily grind and we don't have budgets to travel and we don't have budgets to this and that to do that evangelist role in addition right. to what we're doing. Two, in two quick and points think, to yeah. add on that. You know, I, yeah. I, I was at a, a thing in California years ago and, and one, of the, one of the supply diversity officers got up and said, when we were in trouble, where were the MBEs? So your point of, they need to advocate if a, C, a letter goes to a CEO that I got the business that does make a difference. It helps you internally. And we don't do a good enough job in that. I can tell you, in food service and hospitality, one of my best friends, African American, very involved in the supply chain scenario. And he says, it's not my job to figure out the little guys and the big guys. It's your job. You guys need to get together and figure out to collaborate. If you all can't collaborate, I'm not selling it up the food chain. So I do think we have to be advocates for who's doing a good job. We have to call out the companies that are doing a good job, the, the, the councils that are doing a good job, that the NMSDC is moving in a new direction. Food service checked out of NMSDC a number of years ago, and we were having this conversation last night. A couple of the big players aren't there. Well, that shouldn't be okay. That shouldn't be okay, but as long as there's no noise, nobody's fingers get slammed in the door, and nobody complains, no letters get sent, nothing gets done. So we, as consumers and as believers in supply diversity, have to support the officers. We got to write letters. We got to make phone calls. Yeah, that's extra work, OK? But that's what you have to do. And we really have to start thinking about, where does technology come involved? Where's the Yelp for supply diversity, yep. there you OK? Go. Where, where are we going to try to get our cousins and aunts involved in this saying, hey, it makes a difference if you buy from company A who supports women's issues and LGBT issues or black issues, and you know, you need to know about that. So, so I think, you know, we are, are, are we've seen the problem and part of it is us. We are the problem. Yeah, Jerry, and Jerry makes a good too. point, because could, could you, and I was gonna actually call you, because the yeah. LGBT community, <laughs> I, I know does a very good job of, of supporting companies that's, that support a, them a and not yeah. so if you could quality index. Sure, yeah, and, and I think you know one of the, I think that's one thing that the LGBT community ha is, does really well yeah. is understanding the impact that, like I said before, this full circle of corporate diversity, right, and, and how those things relate to each other. Um, the Human Rights Campaign is a fantastic LGBT organization that uh, works on a number of different issues. We collaborate with them, talking about collaboration, within our own space we collaborate with organizations uh, around their workplace project. And the main uh, product of the workplace project is the Corporate Equality Index. It measures companies um, on you know, how good of a place they are to work for LGBT people, what kind of you know, corporate citizen are they, how are they impacting the community, are they you know, doing things that are positive or that are detracting from the LGBT equality movement. And one of the things that is being measured now is supplier diversity within that because of our, works, our, our work together in collaboration. And it goes such a long way. And GLCC, we just had our national conference uh, in Dallas two weeks ago and we'll be in Las Vegas next year, quick plug. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, the atmosphere around those companies that have 100% on the Corporate Equality Index or have 85% you know, and next year they're striving for 100, it is incredible to see the interaction between LGBT business owners, LGBT people in general, and folks that represent those companies. There's pride, there's, there's loyalty. So Victoria, can you tell people, everybody doesn't know about the Corporate Equality Index, so yeah. can you? Well, you mentioned it and just, you know, but everybody, isn't, everybody here and everybody watching on YouTube may not know. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's basically the number one indicator for how LGBT inclusive a company really is. Um, from that, I mean, we know that gay men, 89% uh, of gay men and 92% of lesbians will change their purchasing decisions based on a company's engagement with the LGBT community. Um, a lot of times you're finding out, you know, their rating based on the Corporate Equality Index or, or other types of support that you see in the community. So at least for the LGBT community, we've, we've figured out that loyalty right. really counts and it goes a very long Absolutely. way. And that does translate into supplier diversity and it does translate into how LGBT people in the workplace make purchasing decisions. We recently did a study on that as well and some of, you know, if you talk about consumer loyalties and things of that nature, well, we're still people, we're individuals. Mm -hmm. When we go to work and you have a decision, all things being fair and equal, competitive price, competitive uh, quality, well, you know, if, if you look at it, there is, there is a, you, you can see that those allegiances do transfer into workplace decisions as well, so. Okay. And that's a, a very practical approach to um, looking at consumers and consumer behavior I do think that some of the challenges that we face 
um, in the broader discussion of uh, supply diversity is the decisions that corporate America makes in its own enlightened self-interest related to who is our public. Um, you know, again, because our focus is minority supplier development, we, we've got different stressors that we're looking at that really don't get measured, um, and we've got to find a way to create those measurements because all communities make decisions based on the things that are important to them. Um, some of the communities that uh, are part of the groups that we certify, um, they haven't really looked at that because for 40 plus years, they've been striving to achieve the American dream. So now that we're looking at um, probably another uh, business cycle where uh, corporations are starting to be more uh, open-minded, um, they're starting to do more investment, uh, we've got to look at how, as communities go, there is an equal uh, investment, if you will, in those businesses that provide the level of support that will grow businesses and business owners because you know nobody's really working for the gold watch uh, uh, like they used to. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I had a couple of points I wanted to make. One on, on following up uh, with your comments earlier, uh, Lewis, regarding the uh, the issue of small versus large diverse suppliers, and you know part of our name is development. And I'm a firm believer that we really have to address the needs of as many MBEs as possible in given the, the needs of the large corporations and their desire to work with you know, highly capable, globally competitive minority businesses, uh, we have to be able to uh, structurally develop a program that is gonna benefit all minority entrepreneurs, in my view, who strive to be excellent suppliers. And you know, I had two incidents last week on this point. I had uh, a, an MBE that uh, got their first loan that we helped them get. You know, it was a small loan. It was a $50,000 loan. But they were so happy that, that we were instrumental in helping them get that loan. So they're getting on their way. And the same week, uh, Worldwide Technology, you mentioned, was listed as, on a contract with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for $500 million. So we worked on that project. So we have to work on, on in, in, in this whole spectrum of, of businesses. And, and secondly, I wanted to talk about this connection between supplier diversity and overall corporate goals. Uh, and we're doing something, I think, that is unique, in, at least in our history. At our, we have a trade show coming up, and what we decided to do this year is we've invited our corporate members to bring their business development salespeople to our trade show. Now that was sort of a non-starter many years ago because the MBEs felt, well, why are you bringing them? We're trying to get business. Those guys are trying to get business too. We don't want to compete with them. But it's my view. I'm an economist by training, so we, I'm, I'm into competition, but I think that the having the business development salespeople of our corporations at our trade shows and, because this was a condition of their participation, that they had to have a booth for, that only had their procurement people. So if they wanted to bring their sales team, they had to have their procurement people there. I want our MBEs talking to those salespeople. I want our MBEs talking to those procurement people. I want those salespeople to understand that they can do a better job selling to this community if those procurement people are also doing a better job buying from this community. And I think that's the connection that gives us leverage with corporate America because, you know, as much as we talk about the bottom line or reducing costs, I still think the C-level is primarily focused on the top line. They want to grow their business, right. they want to grow their market share, and to the extent that we can participate in that growth in the top line in a meaningful way and include minority businesses, I think we're ahead of the game. So, Jessica, I'm gonna come back, back to you because, I, you know, we talk about indexes, you know, about how well people are doing, and you, you guys do a great job. And, and, and you're one of those industries that people really could make an informed choice. I mean, yeah, I may like one property better than another, but if I'm, if I'm gonna sit and play you know, at a gaming table um, and let you take my money, I'd rather, I'd rather Caesars take it than uh, <laughs> somebody else take my money, right? No, but 
you know, so what is there, how would you feel about an index that shows overall kind of supplier diversity performance and, and to inform people, to make informed choices about what, what they do? Because again, you know, people can say, oh, people do this, and people say things are not always informed, you know, they do this or don't do it, but a, a kind of an independent set of metrics that kind of showed companies so the public, and you know, we, the census has all this stuff about, everybody knows the minority, majority stuff is coming. It's coming much sooner than anybody anticipated. How, how would that play at Caesars? Well, I think one of the things that, you know, uh, Victoria mentioned the Corporate Equality Index, you know, we're 100%, and, uh, and their conference next year is gonna be at Caesars Palace. You know, we've, we have, have um, Jerry just mentioned um, seeing the Organization of Chinese Americans in DC. Their conference is at Caesars. And, and the reason that a lot of these things, um, you know, in MSDC quarterly, uh, if we yeah. saw a few there in, yeah, in, there. in, in December, yeah. and, and, the com and the quarterly was Harris, New Orleans, you know, not too long ago, with Fela and it, it's Caesars in Las Vegas. And I think, I think right now there's an informal index. There's this who's doing what, and, you know, when we're in the meetings and convention space, that informal index is is um, is helpful, and even in the in the um, the much more formal index like the corporate equality, we, we continue to to strive and to see results. Uh, there's a lot of factors when going into that, and I think it, it's really important when you consider those pieces, who's who's the evaluator and how we're evaluating. And as a panel, we keep coming up with different ideas. This person needs, we need to do this. This needs to do that. Needs to do that. It, it's, the, it's the direction we need to go in, and we need to, in the meantime, figure out a lot of these, these individual pieces. I, I, wanted, I wanted to, you know, talking about index, I think it talks a little bit about innovation. And I wanted to take that a step further and talk about, you know, when you're talking about large businesses and small businesses, I think in the areas that we can talk more about innovation and supplier diversity, that's where we're gonna see the future. And when we're thinking about creating indexes or, 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 or decision making, we have to think of the future of where we're going to be. And I'll, and I'll give you an example of where I'm going and, and type of thought. I know it's changing the discussion a little bit, but we have a lot of hotel rooms. Who do you think has the most hotel rooms in the world? What company? Or who has the most, I should rephrase it, who has the most beds? Who has the most beds to offer? United States government. Couchsurfer.com. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say, I say this piece is, you know, we did this talk of, oh, I'm smaller, you know, Sal mentioned a minute ago about how she worked with this one facilities company that joined forces with another. In the supplier diversity world, in the sustainability world, we talk about innovation and utilizing what we have and excess space. When we come into the supplier diversity world, and we're talking about this, we're like, we need to get the option to get into the contract, but we need to develop our thought process so that we're thinking of the excess space that's today. We have kitchens that aren't being utilized today, but not cooks that are asking to utilize them. We have, all of you, where's your car? Do you all, everyone in this room have a car? Yeah. Are you driving it right now? So there's a car that a rental car agency is making money off that car, but all the cars in this room could be making money for somebody else that needs a car at this moment. And there's no capital startup because the cars are already bought. It's the innovation and the thought and that process. And I think as, as a world of supplier diversity, the more that we can promote innovation, I see this from my suppliers who come to me with crazy ideas and, you know, and the role that I have that straddles um, sustainability and supplier diversity, I notice, okay, maybe we can make this crazy idea work. Um, but the idea is we need to think about where that place is going so that we continue to move that discussion forward. And, and I wanted to leave that thought process so you can continue to think of maybe someone in the room has an idea for renting out ski equipment. Because I'm certainly, you know, I need ski equipment. I don't have any and I would love to rent someone else's while it's not being used. And there's so many businesses we can utilize when we think of where the innovation is really going in our industry. Uh, and then from that point, once we've created and understand that innovation, understand how we can play a role in it. Can, can I chime in because, uh, and this stuck with me so um, powerfully that I've probably overused it every time I have uh, you know, the opportunity to stand at a podium, but when we uh, first did our North Star 
uh, session around our strategic plan. We were in Dr. Fred's region, we were in Boston, we had uh, the CPO of an unnamed company that spoke at the luncheon, and he said, and I believe in my heart of hearts, that if every corporation and every supplier used this, to your point, Jessica, we would have a radically different discussion around using diverse suppliers. He said, you know, we got, you know, 60,000 or so suppliers in, you know, in our supply chain. He said, however, if you can either A, help me increase my bottom line, to your point about the top line, if you can B, help me take costs out of my business because, I mean, since we're talking about truths, you know, everybody knows that at one point in time, supply chain wasn't called supply chain, it was called something else. I, 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 I might be even thinking it might have even been called purchasing. And in many purchasing organizations, you know, if it wasn't a green eye shade, you know, it was somebody, you know, with, uh, you know, steel shelves taking orders on the phone or making orders on the telephone. And of course, the profession has changed, but the reality was those people only existed to drive down costs. And there are probably way too many companies that still maintain that focus. But that's a reality to deal with. But the third thing that really he really said was, and or, because he didn't say or, he said and or, provide me with such innovation so as to give me a competitive advantage, especially in my non-core activities, then I will find a place for you in my supply chain. I've told every uh, minority business that's certified with us, I've told, you know, almost all of the corporations that were willing to listen to me um, that story. And uh, I'm still um, convinced that we can really move that to a level where it's not the kind of conversation we continue to have, but it really is about how do you create new opportunities? Where are the businesses that are today too small to get contracts with major suppliers that are willing to put a new idea together with another business and change the game? That's, to me, baking a new pie. Right, I, I also want to bring up this issue of business versus entrepreneurship because I think that's what we're talking about. And I've had this conversation with countless minority business owners uh, because I do think that the spoils will go to the entrepreneurs, not the business owner. And we've got a lot of business owners, not just in the minority community, but out in the small business community. They, their business has is, is become a glorified job. While they may have 50 or 100 people working for them, it's still a job. It's not an entrepreneurial enterprise. And what we have to, I think, in terms of changing the mindset of the minority business community is that they've got to become entrepreneurs. And that is where the innovation comes in. That is where the focus on not just where is the market right now, but where will the market be. It's not based on what you did five years ago that was, may have been successful five years ago. It may be successful today, but it is not going to be successful tomorrow. It's not me too. We have too many businesses in, in all, of come in all shades that are starting businesses in the same business, the same industry, trying to do the same things as the worldwide technologies of the world are. Worldwide is successful so we can be successful. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be trying to do them. You yeah. should be trying to replace them. And you know, that's with all due respect with worldwide technology, but that's the game. The game is not what you've done or where you are, it's what you can be. And if you don't get that straight, you're not going to be in business. So, Dr. Fred, but don't, don't we discourage that in this network? I mean, entrepreneurs get their companies built and they sell them. Corporations, last thing most corporates, if I've been a good supplier to you, I've developed a 15 minutes, oh, I'm going to sell my business to someone, so ah, right? They panic, right? I've seen corporations not be very happy when people take that entrepreneurial course and grow their business and sell it now, and no longer you lose $100 million of, of but, spend. But I think that that's the exact thing we should be trying to get, is companies to be so successful, so profitable, that somebody even bigger wants to buy them. Buy and I think that that is success. We had our largest MBE in Connecticut, uh, Specialized Packaging Group, was a startup in 1983, grew to $300 million, sold to a global uh, uh, a venture company three years ago that was consolidating packaging companies. He and I are working as closely today as we were when he had his company. He's an entrepreneur, and entrepreneurship doesn't go away. 
So yes, companies Procter & Gamble and others were upset that they lost their biggest supplier, but you know what? That's business. That's business. Mm -hmm. That's business. Yeah. And that's what we're in the game of. This is, like we said earlier, this isn't social welfare. This is business. And, and that is success. And the fact of the matter is no business is going to last forever from the perspective of the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. At some point, everybody in here who owns a business is going to be separated from their business either because they sold it, it went out of business, or they die. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Can I? I, Sally, oh, Jared, I'm going to have everybody kind of make sure. some wrap-up I have just remarks. two comments on, on those two things, because I cannot underscore enough the innovation point. Yeah, exactly. Innovation is the one thing that will get you in the door outside of a procurement process. What do I mean? When I said earlier, we only put you in the process and on the re request for proposal and we leave you alone, right. except if you have a product we don't have and it affects something in our business. I'll give an example. Tiny, tiny business came out of Florida. This lady who's a former nurse and her husband started a, an innovative patient gown, okay? And we're in healthcare. And the patient gown, duh, closes in the back, it overlaps, and has slits for the things that you need inside. Very like, wow, how come we didn't have that 100 years ago? But um, for the first year, I was being told, well, we have to wait until we're sourcing that. We have to wait until so we're sourcing that. Once my program, my strategy, started having weight in the company, I said, well, I want somebody to try it because it's innovative. So get me one place to try it out and then tell me. If it's not good, I'll walk away. It was trialed, people fell in love with it, and our Fresno Medical Center signed a contract with them. They've only been around two and a half or three wow, that's years. Great. Tiny time. They would have taken 10, 15 years to get to a Kaiser Permanente because you need to have national distribution and this and that and we're Kaiser Permanente. And, but it's that angle. They had something we didn't have and what did it affect? Membership satisfaction, which is a huge scoring thing that we get scored by in, in, in all of our ratings. But the other thing on the investment part. So I don't mind a small business, an MBA, WBE getting sold. What I find, though, is they go and get investment from white companies. It's like, where's the African-American or minority investment in the, these companies that are trying to get investments? Um, and I think that's an area that really, that's part of the elephant in the room, because they, they come up, they grow up, and they start needing money. And then the, the, their own communities aren't bringing that money in that's from right. the right channels to support them. Um, and so the money stays within still the communities that have the majority. Well, that, let me do Jerry. Let me get Jerry, then we're going to. Yeah. I'm going to click on the, on the innovation piece because yeah. that's how you get into our business. You know, our focus now as an organization is teaching cultural intelligence, cross cultural competencies. If black companies don't understand the issues of Hispanic customers, you can't sell to them. And so, voila, uh, the, the, the food distribution companies are trying to sell to Hispanic owned restaurants, black owned restaurants, and Asian owned restaurants. And you know what? We came up with a solution that said we'll give you live instructor-led training. We'll give you e-learning-based content that teaches you that Dominicans, on Puerto Ricans, on Mexicans, okay, on Guatemalans, they eat different foods, et cetera, et cetera. You need that to sell to these communities. Mm -hmm. If you go and engage those communities before you understand them and show them respect, you get no business. So guess what? We went right to the front of the line, got products in six markets right now that they're testing because we're solving a problem that they have no other solution for. So you are 100% innovation. We talk about it as being what supply diversity brings, but we don't walk it enough. Mm -hmm. And I don't think enough MBEs spend time thinking about it. So that, that's exactly where I think this, this conversation needs to go. The elephant in the room is if we get innovation right, if we focus energy on innovation, we'll get in the door, not just through supply diversity, but through the front door. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Walter Lippmann said, the best servants of the people, like the best valets, must whisper unpleasant truths in the master's ear. It is the court fool, not the foolish courtier, who the king can least afford to lose. So starting with you, Jessica, what unpleasant truth do you think is really critically important that is whispered in the master's ear to get the elephant, to address the elephant in the room. Uh, uh, our ch chief diversity officer always says we have to have the capacity to call the baby ugly. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 I think all too often 
we're too sensitive. We're too sensitive, we're gonna offend someone, we don't, we don't wanna tell them something. We have to have the capacity to say, this is that our end goal is how do we make things better? And if it's gonna make it better, that with honesty and with, with empathy and compassion that we are enabled and we give that feedback internally and externally to not be afraid of who might, what they might think, what they might think of us, what the politics might be, the fear. But as long as we remember to say with honesty and with empathy, we have to have the capacity to call the baby ugly. And I think, you know, if you can't change the baby, that might not be the best thing. I'm not saying go <laughs> tell your friend's baby they're ugly. But, um, but internally, we need to be able to do that. And I think, uh, I think as we move forward, we have to remember that we're just trying to make things better. And what is better, both in our own businesses and within, BE, with, within your own business and, and within society, what does better mean? And have that dialogue. Jerry, what unpleasant truth must be whispered in the master's ear? Well, piggybacks on, on hers, but uh, we really have to be willing to raise our game. Uh, this is uh, 2013, and we have to raise our game across every, every angle. We cannot accept less than high quality product and services. We gotta call out people where they are and, and really have to push the envelope. It's not comfortable to get out here. I'll probably catch some heat for some of the things I said if they go on YouTube, but it's the truth. Some of those companies write us checks. We have to have some courage to step out there and have those conversations that really need to be had about innovation, about calling the baby ugly, your business is not viable. And most importantly is collaboration. I don't see enough collaboration in the African American community with Latinos. We, we, we didn't even get into the LGBT hating that's going on out there. But we're gonna have to collaborate if we're really gonna be successful so that we all can tell the story to the rest of corporate America the value that supply diversity brings. Victoria? Well, um, no, I'll just say, you know, I think, um, you know, what NGLCC does is, is really rooted in, in the business community, and we talk about equality from an economics perspective, but the truth of the matter is LGBT people are not equal in this country yet, and we're in the middle of our fight for our rights on a national level. I sit on this panel as a lesbian not having the same rights that each of you all have in various capacities of my personal life, and I think for corporate America to understand what that means and be able to um, really do something about it from a business perspective is, is noble and it's admirable and it's a challenge that I issue to all of the companies in the room and all the companies that watch this, that there is, America is great because we can change where we live. We can make that change. We can realize the American dream and uh, make it something that's accessible to all people in this country. So it's a challenge, yeah. Let's do it. All right. Sally? Um, I'm going to say, um, first of all, pat yourselves on the shoulder, first of all, because America is far beyond so many other places around the world. Like I said, I come from Egypt, look at it now, um, conversations like this don't even occur, not even in people's dreams yet. So America has come a long ways. I just watched the movie The Butler and I, it was profound. If you haven't seen it, really go and see it. But to me, supplier diversity the, the real message to me is America is in trouble. It really is. Our kids, my son, who's seven now, when he's 37, if things don't change in this country today, he will be in a country that it will be recognized as a developing country. That says it all. If the, if the people that don't, that the inequalities are touching the most are growing the fastest, they're the poorest, they have low access to care, to education, are gonna be the majority, then the white folks are in trouble and so is everybody else. Because there's not gonna be tax payments as much, pension plans, anything. So the whole country is going downhill if these programs don't succeed and keep succeeding in the future. So who are, we gonna, who are we gonna tell that to? I mean, you're exactly right. Anna. To everybody, you and from Lynn the and, top of the mountain. <laughs> I mean, we need to take you and Lynn Greenhall on the road and, and Jim Laurie. But, <laughs> yeah, no. well, you know, that, that is a question that deserves an answer on so many levels. Uh, I, th I think the, the, the best way to address it is 
uh, you know, we've got to be really honest about um, who our public is, who our customers are, and tell the truth about what's necessary. Um, you know, we started our strategic planning session February of 2011, thinking that success would look like 50,000 certified MBEs or more, and having all of the Fortune 1000 be um, dues paying members. Well, the reality is, you, you, if we could find uh, 10,000 businesses that are certified and capable of doing business with our existing members, we would be an, an outrageous success. Um, but, but that's where we are, and it's our reality. And I, I only say that because in my unique role, you know, I, I get some really interesting calls about the things that people want us to do and the positions they want us to take, but none of them have anything to do with you know, moving the needle when it comes to um, you know, putting people to work, contributing to local economies, you know, strengthening uh, you know, the opportunity for um, businesses to really participate in this so-called American dream. And, and I, I, I regret to say on the, you know, the eve of the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, you know, we may still have a dream deferred, but it's only deferred if we allow there to be continued deferment. And I, I really thank um, the uh, organizers of this p panel and, and this um, bigger discussion for um, the opportunity for me to come in to um, participate with my colleagues uh, in, in our regional affiliates, but, but also on behalf of um, our organization our, and, our, and our members and our president, Mrs. Josette um, Wright Lacey, for you know, this you know, real significant uh, opportunity to speak truth to power. Dr. Fred, again, well, what is the unpleasant truth that must be whispered in the master's ear? Well, you know, I think it uh, kind of, my, my comments will be pretty much bring us back to where we started. And I, I think it really is about leadership uh, and leadership at the, at the national, at the highest level. And I'm talking about leadership and not that we haven't had leadership from the President of the United States on this issue, but I do think uh, there is, there's room for the president to, to, to really move the needle, as Mark has said, by bringing this issue to the forefront as, as an economic issue of the future of this country. And I don't think we have had, he has had that discussion uh, directly on minority business development. And I think that that is something that is appropriate. It's not disrespectful, but it's, it's absolutely necessary. We have a billboard up right now in Connecticut uh, that says corporate America plus minority business equals hope and jobs. I believe that. And, but we have, to, we have to have leadership across the political spectrum and corporate America to make that a reality. I agree. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists. Please, please, please make sure you go to the bigger discussion that because this is ongoing in terms of impact, real economic value. I want to thank our host, uh, LA, I can, I'm a mess of the Louisiana Minority Supplier <laughs> Development Council. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you.